I want to start out by looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Uh, remember when I used to connect more often with the Living God Ministries on their uh, nightly phone uh, conversation and fellowship that this, this came up a lot, this, this book. Uh, it's a meaty book. Let's begin by reading in verse 1. I beseech you, and this is Old King James, so I'll read it as it is. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, up to this point in the book, Paul had been giving doctrinal instruction and most recently encouragement that Israel has not been lost, but there is yet a sacrifice for them and a time when God will open their minds and call them to the truth they had rejected. Very fitting for the times that we live in. It's Like I said, it's a very meaty book, of course, and Paul was gifted, uh, even though hard to understand sometimes, he was gifted in writing about deep, profound subjects then, which are absolutely applicable to you and me today. You know, I think of some of the things that I have written over the years going back, and they're really not applicable to today. Times have really changed. And yet, some things are still applicable. And the, and the interesting thing with God's Word this way, too, is Paul, as he writes, then spends most of the rest of the book of Romans giving encouragement to the church in Rome. Now, I don't know about you, but over the last few years, at times, I face discouragement with things. It can be simply opening up the news for the day or hearing of someone suffering a horrible health issue or crisis or just watching what's taking place. You know, we have freedom of speech in this country, but my, oh my, from the leadership to the recipients, everything in between. I can't, growing up, I just would have... Well, I would have been in trouble with my parents, but there were just things I don't, you know, I've been, if you've been pulled over by a police officer unjustly, you weren't doing anything wrong. I remember that time in Tampa, remember that, where I pulled in, I drove down the street and pulled into a house, and I heard this, whoa, but I looked behind me, and here was a car looked just like mine, wow, flying by, and then about 30 seconds later, whoo, 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 whoo. And this car's go, the police car's flying by, and I hear him go, and he backs up and pulls in behind my car. And I'm working on this house. And he says, arms against the thing. And I'm like, wait a minute. He says, don't talk to me. And he was really, he said, you thought you were going to get away from me. I said, that was that car. Yeah, right. You know, eventually, he never did apologize. Eventually, his supervisor said there was a, a mistaken identity here. <laughs> But he, he could have said, hey, I'm sorry, you know. And, but I didn't say, hey, you idiot, what do you think you're doing? I just said, I, whoa, wait, what's, you know. But now it's okay to just be obnoxious to people and write whatever, say whatever. So Paul gives encouragement and practical instruction also how they were to live their lives as Christians. I'm going to just tell you that this sermon I've given before 
not in not here, if you will, but when I've been transferred to different places, I've given this as my first sermon. So you can't find it anymore. It's not online. But if you could, you could go back to another time and you'd find it in three or four congregations. Because I go back through and I think about this, and it's every bit as applicable. But I would prayerfully ask and ask God, what do I speak about? What does one speak about? You ever face that? What do you speak about? Maybe you don't. Maybe you're just full of ideas. and You know, some people, you know, my wife just keeps coming up with them. I don't know where they come from. She must, you know, have just a computer that's her hard drive's really stacked with it. But what do you speak about? What do you talk about for those you care for? I want to spend this time today during this message, looking at the concept that Paul so eloquently reduces here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Because you see, it addresses the heart of the conviction, the commitment, and the submission of one who is a believer and a true disciple of Jesus Christ. If we are a disciple, a student, a learner of our Lord and Master and His Word as He speaks to us, we must be convicted, have a commitment, and have submission complete to Him. And by looking at and reading, examining some of these verses, we can see several points of instruction that Paul gives to you and me that we need to understand. So let me go through them. I've got three or four. We'll see how the time goes. But we'll plan on four, and then we'll break them down and talk about that. The first one, it says, present your bodies, your cuerpo in Spanish, a living sacrifice. What does that mean? The second one is that sacrifice is to be holy and acceptable to God, our reasonable and expected service. Those of you in your jobs or employment, you were expected to do certain things in your responsibility. And it was reasonable, you know. I, I, they didn't ask you, for example, to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and never have any time to rest or now, some, some employers seem like that sometimes. I'm sure, Bruce, you went through some of that where they made you stay up awake with certain drugs or whatever all night. To, in some cases, they had to say, you can't sleep for the next two days or whatever. They would give you things so you couldn't. But that was probably not the norm. That was the exception. But so the sacrifice is to be holy, acceptable to God, and our reasonable and or expected service. And then the third point is we will then, as I comment so often, change from the inside out into the form and the image of God. I have met some people in my life, children of God, that when I think of them, I think that's what God must be like. Now let me share this with you. It's usually older people. And it's usually right before they die, sadly enough, because their life is closing and they know that, but for some time they have been faithfully changing and becoming something different, and it's noticeable. Now, I just look in this room and you look at me, and those of you on the webcam or the webcast, I can't see you but it would be the same for you. You probably could say, oh, if you had known me back when, okay, uh, if you had known me back when, and then filled in the blanks of what I was like, and I'm thinking of some of your stories, <laughs> Martha, you know, I can only imagine, that's all I can do is imagine, and I'm probably glad I didn't know you 50 years ago, but anyway, and you're probably saying the same. But, uh, you know, we change from the inside out. We're also changing on the outside. 
I looked at a picture the other day of my wife and I, and she hasn't changed a lot, but one time uh, a man, the minister came up to me, and we were at a conference, and he, I hadn't seen him in a long time. It had been 25 years probably. And he walked up, and he said, oh, Gail, life's been good. And he said, oh, Scott, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Love you too, you know. But you can look at us, you know. Some of you post on Facebook, look at my hair, all the highlights. It's gray, you know. Some of you just in the short time I've known you, a few years have changed. Um, but what about the inside, the form and image? And we then, as we begin to change, as a result, we'll be able to prove or discern what the will of God is and then live it. Have you ever asked yourself a question, Father, I pray your will be done, well, what is your will? And he says, I'm telling you what my will is. And you read it, and yeah, but what else is your will? I, I get this. He says, no, you don't. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Okay, let's try you out. And then, pa da you're like, okay, did you ever think you'd be in Alabama? All right. Or whatever it is, maybe it, not just physical. What about spiritually? Have you ever gone through something where you're like, oh, and you say, Matthew 6 says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name, praise be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And you just read it over and it kind of flows and it's just good and you feel good about it until he says, okay, child, here's my will. You're like, wait a minute. We were getting along real good until you did that. Right? That's your will? No, no, no. You got the wrong person. Remember Jonah? How many of God's servants, men and women, family members said no, right? Abraham said, I'll figure this one out. You're my friend, so you'll understand. This is my sister. Liar, liar, pants on fire, nose is on the telephone wire, right? When God says, okay, here's my will. You got to go through this, or this has to happen, or to your family, or whatever the circumstance is. That's one of the biggest lessons we'll ever learn. But you'll be able to discern that. As your relationship with God, as you follow that being a living sacrifice, you'll say, it'll nag on you. Trust me, been there. God, do you want me to do this? Yeah, I do. And your mate may say, you're crazy. No, I really feel we need to do this. My dear wife, I won't even bring up all the examples, but in our life, there's times she said, he, have you, not to me, but have you lost, your, has lost his mind? Right? And you say, I believe this is God's will. Now, we need to be careful because some people say, well, I prayed and fasted about it, and it's God's will that we do this. What? You're going to quit your job? You got a good job? You're, everything's going fine? Family's here, and you're just going to move because you like the fishing over there better? I don't know if that's God's will. Yep, I fasted and prayed about it. Well, how do you argue with that? You say, well, I fasted and prayed too, and my conclusion is different. And then the fun begins. But sometimes God's will, many times, is not what we would ever imagine. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. But yet, we can discern that, and we understand it better. Paul seems if you will, to give us a formula. I was always keenly interested in the formula. That's why for when I was younger and they would say, well, here's a certain thing we'll give you, whether it's eye drops to make your, you know, bigger so they can see and, you know, you can't see for several hours afterwards because too much light comes in because your just pupils dilated too much. But I always ask, what's the formula? What's in this? What's in the new and improved ketchup before when it used to be old and needed improvement? What's new? What's in the formula? Okay. What's in, you may think I've lost it, but what's in gasoline? When I stop at the pump and I see, okay, here's how much the taxes are, and here's, you say, do you do all that? I do. But what's in the formula? What makes Exxon's formula whatever better than mobiles and they all claim these things. 
What's in the formula? What about Coke? A cola. I got to rephrase that. Instead of Coke, like cocaine. Coke, a cola, the drink, which I don't drink. But um, what's the special formula? Do you remember? It's a secret ingredient. That's why they call it the real thing. Uh, RC tried to duplicate it, I think. Uh, Pepsi. Uh, various others. I think there's a cola that Sam's Club or Walmart has its own. Usually about 10 cents, or used to be 15 cents a can when everything else was 50, so I don't know what it is now. What's in the formula? Right, you know? And, and those that take insulin, what's in the insulin? Where'd it come from? Don't want to do too much research. <laughs> I used to take glucosamine chondroitin, I think that's what it's called, for my knees, until I found out, for me, that 95% of it came from shellfish. So I stopped. That's my choice. But others may say, no, I don't have a problem with it. That's your choice. But what's in the formula? And so Paul gives a formula. Let's examine it and see if we can learn and apply it in our lives. So first of all, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Does anybody, anything jump out at you? Living and sacrifice. Do those two... Anybody, those okay with you? I'm a what? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, she said an oxymoron. <laughs> this hearing, I'm going to have to get miracle air eventually. <clears throat> Paul is using some terminology of the priesthood in animal sacrifices. But there's, as we say, a twist here. This is something a Greek would never say because he was interested in the spirit or the mind primarily. It is you and me he's talking about. But rather than becoming a burnt sacrifice, what expected of us is to last the remainder of our lives as a living sacrifice. Why? Because we've been called to do a job. Part of our calling is to do something. Now, you may say, I'm looking at Martha here to pick on her. You may say, well, I can't really do a lot to serve people. I'm, you know, I don't get out a lot. I can't walk a long distance, all these things. God doesn't say, no, only people that are 31 years old, mature, know the Bible perfectly, Young, agile, don't require much sleep, healthy. It doesn't say that. Yeah, it just took care of all, wiped all of us out, right? Well, some of us, I don't know, some of you may still. But rather than becoming a burnt sacrifice, we've been called to do a job. I think sometimes in this fast-paced world, we forget what God has called us for. I know I do, because you get caught up in everything as it's going, and you forget. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, uh, go back a little bit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13, notice what he wrote. It says, present your bodies, not just your mind. In Romans 6, verse 13, Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. In verse 16, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants, what did it say? Servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness and holiness. I'm looking at this beginning at verse 16, going down through verse 22. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight times it says servants. 
What does God expect? Over the years, I've had a similar conversation with folks who have told me they were to accept Jesus Christ, which means to make Him Lord in their heart, and that was it. And it is love and the spirit of love that God wants from us, and that's it. The physical things don't matter. I was reminded of this recently in a conversation. Someone said, I love your ministry. I love what you guys are doing and what you believe. And there's a lot of others doing the same. I said, yes, there is. But he said, this Sabbath thing, the unclean meat, the holy day observance, this tithing, all this stuff, that, no, I'm not into that. And he said, Christ... And you can almost repeat it for them. He became Sabbath for us. So our rest is in Him. And if we just love Him and keep every day as the Sabbath, we don't have to worry about a specific day. And I said, do you really believe that? He said, of course, you should. You would have more followers. And I said, maybe, but I'm not in it for followers. We're in it together to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so it has to be from God's Word. Whatever. I love that line. That just That's a conversation stop, stopper. Teenagers are good at that. You try to talk to them sometimes. I, I know I, I shouldn't say it. That's a generality. Sometimes younger people can do this as an answer when they don't want to talk anymore. They say, whatever. You know, you want to take their bubble gum out of their mouth, but you realize, okay, but whatever. So I just said, okay. So Paul is clear. It isn't just our minds and our heart that must be under submission to God, but our bodies and actions also. In everything we do, everything we are. In other words, a what? A complete sacrifice. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're close there. Let's pop over there. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What, Paul writes, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. So God's dealing with us here in our body. You are bought with a price, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this one and offend several people that will watch this especially in the public setting. And I will save that for another message to get more specific. We were purchased mind and body by the blood of Christ. Did you hear what I said? We were purchased mind, heart, and body, which the brain, the mind, part of that, the brain and the heart are part of the body, which you know what I'm talking about, That is what we talked about and have been on the Bible basics on Tuesday nights. This is baptism. It's the commitment we've made, or hopefully we will make at some point. That is what God has called everyone here to do. He's called us to do that. And if we aren't taking our baptism seriously or looking toward that at some point seriously, Are we responding to God or are we just marking down, putting in our time? I'll just hang tight on that one. I don't want to make that big of commitment. You know what is alive and well in the world today? Nobody wants, no, very few people want to commit to anything. They don't. As one person said, I want to leave my options open. Okay, leave your options open. What are your options? I don't know. But if I, if I get baptized, then I have to do certain things that I may not want to do. And if I don't, then I still got those options open. I can still do that at some point, but until then, I can sort of, I don't really have to commit fully that way. Hebrews chapter 13, here's a final ex- exhortation by Paul to the book. Hebrews chapter 13 Verse 15, 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Now, I don't mean, oh, thank God, thank God, thank God. People just throw that around like a saying. But do you mean that? When you say, praise be to God, I don't have a problem hearing that, provided it's genuine, but then I'm not getting into the business of deciding whether you're genuine or not. Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. And verse uh, 16, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. Now, that's a good line because that can work in marriages, families, fellowships, employment, with your neighbors, right? To do good and to communicate, don't forget that. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. I remember years ago calling someone, this is probably 20 years ago now. I called someone, they said, what do you want? Did I do something wrong? I said, I'm just calling to see how you are and say hi. What for? If there's a problem, I'll call you. I said, sorry, just wanted to see how you were. Well, now you know, click. Right? I'm like, okay. So I didn't call that person quite as often, you know? It's sad that we live in a culture at times that, you know, you only get a call when you need something done, right? You never get how you doing, how are things. So we communicate, and these sacrifices, God is well pleased. He deals with us in the body and as a body. We were purchased mind and body by the blood of Christ. He says, offer praise to God, be thankful, don't forget to do the good as well as just speak about it. Right? Do we just talk about all the good that we do? Or do we do it? In word and in deed to be a living sacrifice. Some talk the talk, And they talk it well, don't they? They're really good. But do they do it? Some will feel they've been a member of the body of the church forever, decades, and they're going to float into the kingdom. And my comment to that is no, not really, actually. Because there are many scriptures that refer to that attitude. Do we live it? The second point, Paul says we are to be holy and acceptable, our expected service. He continues with the language relating to sacrifices that the priesthood performed. You read through the laws regarding the offerings, Numbers 29 is a great book, for example, Numbers 29, and you find consistently the animal to be offered had to be without spot or blemish. You recall that? No spot, no blemish. I used to... Years ago, when I would go deer hunting, and I hope this doesn't offend those that believe hunting is sin, because it isn't, to just kill things for the fun of it, I would say you shouldn't do that. But I used to hunt deer a lot, and would still if I had a place to go. Um, I love to, when I finish skinning the deer, it's hanging up and you're skinning it, I look for any blemishes. Any holes, maybe during archery season, somebody tried to, and it became okay afterwards. It didn't die. Or a disease, or maybe it, had a, it got caught in a fence at one point or hit something, or maybe got in a fight with another deer. All the different things. And if I had a hide that had lots of blemishes, I would just roll it up and throw it away. But if it was nice and no blemishes and without a spot, I would then keep it and tan it. And had a nice carpet until the hair started coming out. Remember that, Gail and Sullivan? Well, God says we are to be, his point is, God required a clean animal, the finest and purest animal to be found. What about us? In Ephesians chapter 5, and the context is marriage, but the point is made of what God and Jesus Christ want 
their church to be, their children. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Interesting how he here is very blunt. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay, that would be called a sacrifice that he might set apart for a holy purpose, sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by his word or the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Here's glorification. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. He wants the church to be clean and pure, spiritually without spot or blemish. This ties in right in with presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. The mind and heart should be pure or becoming that way, but likewise must the actions of the body. The word service that is in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 is also translated as worship in other places. It's an interesting word in the Greek. Have we ever thought that when we worship God and Praise Him. And when we worship together and fellowship God at an assembling as we can, maybe some it's simply online, that's all you're able to do, that that is an act of service. That's why we call it Welcome to Sabbath Worship Services. Bet you never thought of that. We could say Sabbath Worship Service too. It's an act of service to God. It originally meant to work for pay or hire, it came to mean more and more to serve or to that which a man would give his whole life. When you join the military, what do they say? You enlisted in the service, right? Why? Well, it's way more than service (laughs) because you just gave up everything you ever owned or knew to be. Surprise for some of you that are thinking about that. You got no rights, zero. You do what they say, end of discussion, or the consequences. So, but you were, did did you do, they call it military service. What about have you done and been part of Christian service? Yeah. 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 Okay, what have you done? Well, I accepted Jesus in my heart, and I love him. And I love everybody. Okay, so what have you done? Nothing. Don't need to. Everything he did it for me at Calvary. Right? As used in Scripture, it means what one dedicates his life to, the service, it is always used of service to God in Scripture. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, don't look at me. I won't look at anybody. And out there, you, I can't see your reaction. <laughs> but how are you doing? Are you walking in newness of life? Or you sort of just tweaked what you think works and God will accept. And it's some of it's new, but not a lot. This is part of a living sacrifice. This sacrifice we are willingly submitting to God and agreeing to live, and here's the hard one, life as He directs. So maybe you've been through some things, you're like, Oh, I could have avoided that. That should have never happened. Da 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 da. And he says, Look, I got this. I'm directing your life. There's a great purpose. Remember, someone used to say, There's a great purpose being worked out here below, individually and collectively. 
At the same time, he lifts us out of our sin. He cleans us and gives us the ability and strength to live his laws in this way of life better and better. It isn't just about accepting Jesus and, and being blessed and feel good all the time and warm and fuzzy. Because serving God, just like I could say with you when you were in the military, there were times when serving inhaled much wind. I'll let you translate that. Because you're like, whoa, I never signed up for this. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. Right? But you what? You realize when you're married, you said, I agree to serve my wife or my husband, except when they're like this or they do this. God says no. Husbands, to become a sacrifice for your wife as Christ was for the church. Now, wait a minute. Now he's meddling. Now he's getting into areas that he doesn't understand. He says, yes, I do. It's a great mystery. I concerning speaking Christ and his church. And so, when Jesus Christ continues to sacrifice, that great blessing of his sacrifice for us when we're sinning, he says he loves the sinner, not the sin. He doesn't say, okay, you ain't doing what you're supposed to, so you're gone. I ain't, you're not my child anymore, sorry. Don't love you anymore. Now, if you start doing this better, I'll love you again. He doesn't work that way, thankfully. And he knows that we're his dust and we're nothing. It's not an excuse to openly sin, but some equate, well, if I can just live good enough, then he'll love me. Some of us grew up in families like that. If we can just do the right things, mom and dad will love me. If I just do the right thing in society, everybody loves me. I got news for you. In this world, you do the right thing and do everything perfectly, a lot of people aren't going to love you. In fact, just the opposite. Luke chapter 17, verse 10, says there's a mechanical keeping of the law that isn't enough. Okay, some people just say, well, I, I have all these rules and regulations down to the exact, I do this perfectly. That's why in 1 Corinthians, he said, in the new covenant, you don't need to have the outward show anymore. Now, if you want to, that's your business, but you don't have to have it. You don't have to have it in the doorpost where you... Touch that as you walk in. A lot of Jewish families have that. You don't have to wear tassels. It's not a sin to do that, but you don't have to do it anymore. He says the mechanical law, it's a personal choice, but you don't have to do certain regulations that were set up by men. Okay? That's why I don't wear a hamaka or a beanie as they call it. You know, and I, and I do trim my beard. And there are certain things that under the new covenant, God wants a circumcision of the heart and the mind. But we shouldn't look down on others and say, well, they're going to do this or that. Don't get into that minutia. It's an individual thing. Right? And so we are reasonable and spiritual expected service has been called we aren't to stop keeping the commandments of God, but we have to go beyond and keep the Spirit also. So when the Sabbath comes up, do you prepare for it mentally, or do you rush up, sundown on Friday night, you go to sleep, and then you wake up, you know, whenever. Sometimes that happens. But is it like that every week? Or do you say, okay, tonight we're going to have a little special dinner. You know, we're going to, Maybe read parts of Scripture before we eat or during the meal. You know, some groups, they call that a Seder. I'm not saying that you should do that or not. But I can't remember ever being at someone's house on a Friday night to visit that they ever talk about Scripture on the Sabbath at a meal. Or open a Bible and say before, well, I take that back one time up in Minnesota. Before we begin our dinner, let's read these three or four verses and have a brief discussion. I was like, wow, 
we are welcoming the Sabbath. Right? How about, here's one for you. I've been in some places where before the meal starts, there's a prayer, and after the meal ends, there's a prayer to thank Him for what we just had. Well, you don't need to. It's not church service. Or what about if they stop and say, you know what, this is so enjoyable. Would you mind if we just ask one of us ask a short prayer during the meal? Well, that's thinking outside the box. And I'm joking because it's not thinking outside the box. The third one, change and don't be conformed to the world, but transformed. The Transformers movie, I came out, I believe, 2007. It was, to me, fascinating, the original one, although pretty violent, and I can't recommend you go watch it with your children, especially. It was a film series of American science fiction action film based on toys, Hasbro and Tommy, I think, um, created it. And <clears throat> there was the Transformers in 7, 2009. I'm trying to get my memory back. 2009, Revenge of, Revenge of the Fallen. So you had Transformers, Revenge of the Fallen. Dark of the Moon was in 10 or 11, I forget which. If I remember, there's been so many. Age of Extinction, that was 14, because I remember that one, thinking it's extinct, it's the last one. And then there was The Last Night in 17, and then there's been several since then. Um, and so Paul talks about, he, he goes off, and leaves speaking about sacrificial terminology. He now addresses what it means to live this life from now on out. One of the biggest ways to be encouraged as a Christian is to start today and look forward. Now, you don't want to ignore all that's happened in the past, but that can drag us down. It drags me down. I think of what I've done, what's happened in the last 60 years, and like, oh, you know, if I hadn't done this and I do this. I have scars on my body from injuries and other things. Not self-inflicted, but just from fighting there. <laughs> then I look at it and I think, oh, man, if I hadn't done that, I'd be able to do this. If that hadn't happened, I'd be able to do this, and I'd be able to run, and I'd be able to do, and I wouldn't have this pain. And, you know, if I had never played football, I would be able to not have the pain I do in my back and my knees and shoulders. But when you're 13 to 18, 19, you're invincible. I know you with all the pain you have. So, in Ephesians chapter 4, let's go over there. Live this life from now on out. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as the other nations walk, in the vanity of their mind. Oh, if just that one verse, our nation's leaders could read it right now, the group that they keep welcoming, that is murdering and killing people, and that's what they do, oh, we welcome that. Not mentioning it by name, because I don't want this whole message censored. But you know what I'm talking about. It begins with an M. It ends with an M. And it's not plain or peanut. And so we read in verse 17, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. This is not any new revelation to me or you. It's a reminder that we must make a conscious effort to live differently. God doesn't accept us just as we are. We have to change. That's a continual thing. That's why I keep beating the drum week after week, and some of these concepts keep getting weaved in the messages because I'm talking to me, and hopefully it's helpful for you, but we're battling a spiritual battle that we have to be reminded. We have to change. 
That's what we promised to do at baptism. To change what we came to see needed, to work on becoming something bigger than ourselves. Ezekiel chapter 36. I want to go back there for a minute. Ezekiel. Oh, that old, Old Testament. Ah, there he goes again. See, I do read my email. <laughs> I do read it. I don't always respond to all of it, but I do read it. And I do listen. And if God's Word says no, that's what we don't do that, then I don't. Ezekiel, but if he says I, it does, then we do. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. Then will I speak. And here is, it's talking about sprinkle. It's an allegory of the high priest sprinkling blood on the altar in the mercy seat. And if that's a job you think you want, I think you should have thought again. It's a bloody job. Not if you're in England. That's a curse word, bloody. But, but it's a bloody job, meaning bloody job. <laughs> uh, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from your filthiness or from your idols, and I will cleanse you. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I will make take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. So when you receive God's spirit, you can just stop keeping the law of God. It says quite the contrary. I'll give it to you. So you shall keep my judgments and do them. So when you're baptized, receive God's spirit, guess what? You need to keep the Sabbath holy and the holy days. And the many other that God describes. Baptism is what we've been instructed to do. In the same way the water we're immersed in pictures us being cleansed and, sin, cleansed and sins washing away, let me ask you, what is your heart of stone? Hatred? Anger? Indifference? Self-centeredness? Spiritual understanding? Or self-righteousness? Pride on how balanced you are? Maybe pride on how you worship? It all comes down to an inability or unwillingness to submit to God. Colossians chapter 3, I'll, you can write this down later. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 10. You and I, verses 1 to 10 of Colossians 3, are to put off the old things. Now, again, I said we are to do that. I didn't say, boom, you do it and done. If you're like me, there's some things you have struggled for decades, and you will struggle until you die. Yet we not be, need not be discouraged with that. How easy is it to fall back into some of them? But when we do, lying, cheating, filthy language, wrath, and malice, who are we thinking of? Are we living for that moment, or are we living as a sacrifice to our Creator? Have you ever been, anybody ever been on a construction site, or maybe they're doing construction in your home? You remember the time, Gail, we had those guys, we built that big uh, garage shop there on Vernal Avenue in Milton, Wisconsin? Remember that one guy was up putting shingles on the roof, and or whatever, he was working on something. He had obnoxious music, and I went out, and he, I said, hey, could you turn that down? It was back when rap was first starting to become popular. And he had it blaring, and it was just, it had bad language in it as well. It was just annoying. And I came out, and the guy had such a potty mouth, and I said, whoa, 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 time out. I said, listen to yourself. Do you know any other words than, and I said them, don't, don't. He had four words he was using in various orders. He said, you got a problem with it? I said, I do. I don't like that kind of language on my property. And he said, well, get over it. And I said, you're done. He said, you can't fire me. I work for this general contractor. I said, I just fired you. Pick up your stuff and leave. And I called the contractor. I said, find somebody else. He said, what? Oh, he said, let me guess. He told you off and he used this word and that word. I said, yeah. He said, well, he's like that. I said, not on my property. He said, oh, so you're one of those. 
But I've been on a construction site. I'll get them together after a while, say, look, you have women, children playing in the playground here. You have people walking around. You have other workers. Not everybody appreciates the way you talk because it's not godly. And they go, God, who's that? I said, so if you want to work here, you can't use that language. You can't smoke when you're in a client's home. You can't use any bad language. If that means someone says hi, you say hi, and that's it, and don't talk, fine. He said, I've never worked with someone that tries to constrict my language. What the? And I'm like, exactly. So nowadays, it's on television. It's on planes. It's in I was in Walmart yesterday. Oh, my, my ears are still kind of tingly. It was a mother with her two or three kids telling them why she was so mad at them because they wanted some kind of cereal. Thankfully, I just walked down the aisle. And so, the new man is revealed in knowledge, not just love and a good heart and understanding of God's law, but what God is doing and what He requires. We have to change. And all of us, I know I can, think about it. It it rubs off on you, right? Do you remember the first time when Clark Kent said to Miss Scarlet, frankly, my dear, I don't give a quarter? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Or a dime? We were shocked. When Paul Newman and Robert Redford jumped off the the falls there, which was actually in Bolivia, oh no, it was in uh, Mendoza, Argentina, filmed to be in Bolivia, And they yelled something as they held hands and went over the top of the falls, a word we hadn't heard on TV before. There was a wrestler years ago that would just come out and say this one word, and it was okay. Now it's just normal. It's not normal. We need to be different. A living sacrifice doesn't talk like that or live like that or think like that. The final point, I'm going to take the time, prove the good, perfect, acceptable will of God. Several translations say to discern what God's will is. The Greek is dokimazo, which literally means to test, try, discern, or examine. Let's look at a couple other places where this word is used. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 13. Again, finishing up the thoughts Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 3.13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, but because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Our character will be revealed by what comes out on the other side of the trial. What is your trial? Each one of us has our own. We can share it. We can talk about it. We all know everyone here very well, and most of you there I know. We can share what our trial is or has been forever. Maybe it's been our whole life. Maybe part of our life. Maybe now. Whatever it is, our character will be revealed by what comes out on the other side of a trial. That is part of what's happening in this nation. There is good coming from all this garbage, by the way. Did you know that? Because what it's doing for those that are called by God and others are waking up, are we a living sacrifice? It's been easy for all these years to observe, to keep the holy days and the Sabbath and obey God and all you do overall compared to what it is now for some. Some have lost their employment due to mandates, which are not laws, by the way. Just saying. They've lost their jobs. Um, I I won't get off on that because I can. What happens when you're under duress? You know, I have certain, I used to rehaul, been many years, but I'd rehaul engines. I remember the first one I did was a 64 Uh, Dodge, a truck. I could sit on the inside and take the valve covers off. And in working on that, I had to make sure that the bolts I had were the right 
number on top, right tensile strength, right torque, so that when they were put under duress, when you start an engine, whoom, and if you got the motor mounts, but if the bolts aren't the right, you know what they'll do? Bing! They'll shear right off. Do you know that when you have your tires rotated or changed or balanced, you know what they do? They torque your lug nuts down. Specific foot poundage. So that it doesn't fly off. What is put under duress, when you do a Duke's a Hazard turn around, you know, by Bucky's, you know, the tire doesn't go ding, 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 ding. You ever see that happen? Oh, the guy forgot to tighten them down. You need to make sure under duress it's going to hold. Down by Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, the homes, most of them, are built so that when the wind really blows under duress, they're not going to just blow apart. What happens on the other side of the test? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. we are to examine ourselves prior to the Passover. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. We are, however, to examine ourselves on a daily basis. We are to discern where are we in terms of obedience and submission to God. That's what Paul meant when he spoke of proving what the will of God is. We know already that God's ways and therefore His will is good, acceptable, and perfect. What is required for us to live it and experience it firsthand? Book learning is one thing, okay? Book learning is important. I have read so many books. If you're looking for a book, come to my library upstairs sometime, and I'll be willing to say, would you like this? <laughs> right, Bruce? You want these books? Here. I've got two, two more boxes. My father-in-law gave me more boxes. I don't want to give those away, but... Family members that don't know we have services today calling. I have it on my wrist. It's vibrating. Book learning is one thing, okay? No amount of that, though, can replace real practical experience through submission to God's will, not ours. We come to know God's will. We come to know His mind. We come to understand His plan. We come to care about the things God cares about, love His law and His people. I look forward to the Sabbath. Like I said, my whole week centers around the Sabbath. Well, it should. You're a minister. No, it's been that way when I was not a minister, when I was younger. The Sabbath is the circular point we focus on. The rest of the week fits into that and the holy days. It changes your perspective. If you think, I can't wait till Sunday football, then your week maybe centers around football. Or I start work on Monday morning. That's where my week starts. That's your choice. When your day starts out, does it start with the Word of God and the first thing you do, maybe after the biological things you have to take care of, is to pray? It doesn't have to be your major prayer, but at least talk to God and say, hey, I'm up. Good morning. You know? And so, we, what is our focus? Do we love His law? Do we love one another? Is your focus on your spiritual family? Only you can answer that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. Immediately after telling us we need to be bearing good fruit in our lives, Christ then tells what? Let's read it. Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, yes, Jesus, yes, Lord, 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 shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Only those who make a practice of obeying and doing the will of God are going to be in His kingdom. And what you're going to find is someday there's going to be some that are going to say, 
oh, no. Oh, no. And God's going to say, did you do my will? Welcome to my kingdom. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. These couple of verses in Romans 12 contain a lot of food for thought. There's a lot of material that we should consider and keep in mind. It's nothing new, but it is important. When you and I consider our life to be dedicated and sacrificed to God, it helps put the trials into perspective. It puts them in perspective. We are to be living it for a reason and purpose that is bigger than ourselves. Psalm 51 says, A clean heart, a new man, created and created within us. David understood in verse 15 to 17, the blood of animals didn't satisfy God. That wasn't what God is after, ultimately. He wants our mind, heart, and attitude to be yielded and to live as He directs. And there's the difficult part. I want you to submit to my will even when we don't understand it. You ever face that? God, I don't understand. Why? And he says, patience, grasshopper. (laughs) You know, patience. A whole sacrifice. Think about why God has redeemed us from the certainty of death and this awesome future that we have and we talk about and we think about, we focus to serve with him and serve others for all eternity. I'm 60 years old, and I realize I probably got a few left. I don't know how many. I'm not going to start figuring it out. But I definitely don't think I have 40 or 30 years left at all. And 20, I think that's pushing it. I don't know. But I can say pretty safely, I don't think I have 40 years. Not at the way this last six decades have gone. So what is eternity? It doesn't end. That means we're stuck with each other for a long time. Oh, rat, she says. Whether we like us or not, well, we're changing. That's what's awesome. I think about this when I see, you may think, wow, you're nuts. But when I walk sometimes and I see people, I think, I'm going to know them for eternity God willing. I say God willing because when they're given the chance to repent and receive God's Spirit and become part of the family of God and be resurrected to Spirit, I think most of them are going to say, yes, sir. That is so much better than anything I've ever had. Yes, I will, God. So I think that person I've never gotten along well, and I used to tell my wife this, you watch, someone I just never got along with, I will be stuck working under them or with them for eternity because they can repent. They can change. We change. We repent. Let's you and I live as the Apostle Paul commanded, completely submitting to God, our living every moment, physical human beings, yes. And as we begin our walk together and continue that walk as brethren, think about Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ it is who lives in me, who gave himself. By his faith, that's how we live. It's a part of complete submitting to our King, Lord, and Master. It's not some mystical point that we can have supernatural abilities to see what job we take or what house to buy or what the near future holds. Remember the great Tarnak or whatever his name with Johnny Carson? You know, God's will be done. Okay. All right, Victoria, you need to go buy a brand new Escalade. There, that's, that's God's will. I'm joking. <laughs> Paul is talking about discerning, proving, or literally experiencing the calling of a lifetime as he lives in us. So, yes, we are to be a living sacrifice. It is part of an incredible calling that you and I have. And thank God for that. So join me if you would. Let's close in prayer.
Our Father in heaven, God, we come to you at the close of another time together with your word and each other and your spirit. We pray your blessing. We pray your help, your encouragement. Father, we're human, we're weak, we're frail, but help us to be kind and patient to present our whole bodies, our mind, our heart, everything to you as a sacrifice that's acceptable, holy because you've made us holy. You've set us apart. Only you can make something holy. And living in us, Father, that's possible through Jesus Christ and your spirit. We pray you'll bless the meal today. Thank you for it. Nourish us with it. Protect us from the evil one and his fiery darts in this world. Help us to live in this world shining brightly in spite of the many things that we face as your children and say, Father, we are yours. Your will be done. All glory and credit goes to you and we praise you and we ask dismissal now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.